Chapter 16, Part 2, Conquering a Continent, 1854-1890. Talking about this westward expansion movement. Was it a was it a conquest? Was was this was the continent stolen from the people that were there? That's not always the way we hear it. Is that a is that a more realistic way to talk about it, or was it heroic? What was what these people came across from the east and came across the west settlers and and so on? Was it heroic? Okay. Okay, so the Dakota Sioux had been a large and powerful tribe. They had finally been defeated, and they uh, agreed to go on a reservation. Of course, not happily agreed, but didn't have much choice. But they were told that it would include supplies and payments. The government would subsidize them, okay? Uh, but corruption kept most of the funds away from them, including much-needed medicine and food. Uh, so what was happening is some of the people were getting sick. The younger children and the elderly were getting sick, needed medicine, needed food, and there wasn't enough. So the uh, American government wasn't supplying them with the amount of food and medicine that they claimed they would. So the Sioux went through the proper channels but kept getting turned away. You know, nobody really cared. And we see this as a theme that white America will – turn their back on, on a group of non-whites in, in somewhat of a we don't really care about you point of view. We saw what happened in the South, okay, the end of Reconstruction. So, of course, you're frustrated and you're tired and you're angry. So the Sioux went on a rampage, proving the level of anger they had reached was enormous. And they attacked a settlement of white people in 1862. This is during the Civil War. They killed 400 whites, including women and children. Can you call it another senseless Indian attack like most of these other raids were defined? Senseless massacres. Uh, I mean, what would you do if it was you and your family was sick and perhaps dying and the people that said that they were going to give you medicine to help weren't giving it to you? Uh, they lash out to human, also a human element. So the perpetrators were hung in a mass execution though Abraham Lincoln pardoned quite a few. Uh, so white people in the West did not feel safe, and they felt they were unprotected because all the Army's efforts were put toward fighting the Civil War. So an interesting point of view. I mean, they were just coming across the West. They just got there, you know, mixing with the natives that were there and, and conquering them and, and battling with them, but yet they don't feel safe in the West. Okay, so interesting point of view. So perhaps bent on revenge, John Chivington in 1864 with a militia attacked a settlement at Sand Creek in Colorado of Native Americans. John Chivington, your heroes are not our heroes. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Scalps are what we are after. I long to be waiting in gore. The Reverend John M. Chivington. So we, we hear a lot about these pious, uh, supposedly virtuous people, God-fearing uh, people coming across to, to uh, convert people. And, they, and the, uh, God's people are ordained by God. But yet these people are, are, are committing much violence against other people. And here you have a Reverend making statements, statements like that. Okay. So, uh, so the militia came in and slaughtered more than 100 women and children. Uh, they were not provoked, okay? Uh, to make it worse, Jibbington hung men's scalps and women's genitals for all to see in a bar that they hung out in and kind of hung them off the rafters, bragging about their exploits, okay? Ultimately, eyewitnesses told the true story of Jibbington and his raid, that it had it had been a cold-blooded attack, but he was never punished. Okay, let's take our first break here, and please go watch the movie The Sand Creek Massacre, and then come on back. Okay, so The Sand Creek Massacre, November 29th, 1864. Uh, so, an interesting comment: Who's the savage here? You know, is it okay? Is is it? Is it when the Indians do this, they're the savage, but when the white man does, they're not? Is there a justification if you're white to do these, this kind of savagery to people? 
So, you know, it's an interesting paradox and one that we have to look at because that's a that's a kind of idea that that's also seems to come forward to our to our present time. We you know, white America tends to judge people of color's actions different than they would judge themselves. So a side note about Sand Creek. So here you see the modern day sign at the at the National Park, the National Historic Site in Colorado. Uh, so the government determined to make a state park out of it to commemorate the raid. It was decided to call the park the Sand Creek Massacre. Interestingly, the, this is the first time a national organization had allowed the term massacre to be used when it wasn't referring to Native Americans. So the, for the first time, the word massacre referred to the American militia doing the massacring. 2014, the governor of Colorado apologized to the descendants of the Sand Creek Massacre. This is a good thing, perhaps a little late, but perhaps an indication also of a trend that is to come. Uh, the uh, in retaliation of Sand Creek, uh, the Native Americans uh, went on on a, another raid called the Fetterman Massacre, killing 80 soldiers. Okay. Okay. So so this is a this is a tough deal. This is a tough situation between these two cultures. They they were at each other's throats and ne never found a way to mix. Okay. They never found a way to compromise. So the president Grant comes up with the peace policy. So here you see the cartoon. Grant is is converting a native into a European and putting European clothing on, cutting his hair, uh, and the, Americanizing them, okay? So he has a peace policy, and it's partly inspired by Christian advisors. The peace policy rested on the belief that Americans had the right to dispossess native peoples of their lands, take away freedoms, and send them to reservations where missionaries would teach them how to farm, read and write, where Euro-American Euro clothing embraced Christianity. In this way, they would be Americanized and be able to enter mainstream American society. So what's the best way to go about that? Well, you start with children. They're young and impressionable. So the American government took children away from their parents, and they were taken to school excuse me, schools far from home. And they were told they must lose their Indian identity, their name, speech, religion, their way of lip, their ways of living, cut off their long hair, which was sacred to them, okay? Boys were taught agriculture, girls housekeeping, okay? Uh, this, is, this is not the, uh, uh, one of the good parts of American history. This is a shameful moment, taking these kids and forcing them away from their parents into schools far away, and much like a, almost like a boot camp, drilling into them to, to let go of who you are and embrace who you need to become, okay? Let go of your nativeness and become Americanized, okay? Uh, let's go to our next film here, and this is called uh, Into the West, the Carlisle Indian School, okay? So this is a dramatic depiction of the Carlisle School, one of the more famous and large schools, uh, famous to the athlete Jim Thorpe was a Native American, and he came out of uh, Carlisle. Uh, so, again, a dramatization, but based on primary sources and documents to be as genuine as possible. <clears throat> so, obviously, one of the ways to gain control of a people was to take all that was sacred, uh, you know, from them, okay? So, go ahead and watch that film and come on back. Okay, so... This film is about getting a haircut that to a native was only done in times of great mourning. Their their long hair was sacred to them. So you, you could imagine the changes that these that these young people went went through. You know, you're told that you can't speak your native tongue. You can't practice your traditional religion. So so what happened to these kids who it could be argued were brainwashed? I mean, they really ended up being on the outside looking in. So here you see the end result of young people going through the uh, Indian schools. They become Americanized and they, they don't look like Native Americans anymore, what, what we you know, would think of, okay? Um, but they're really not accepted in either, either uh, culture now. You know, the whites never fully accept them as equal, no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried and how much they wanted to look European, uh, the, the whites never fully accepted them, okay? Uh, what about their own tribe, their families and friends? They didn't know what to do with them. Who are these people? 
Uh, they had been taught that the native's ways were wrong and outdated, so they didn't fit in either, either place. So these schools truly created a generation of lost people who could not assimilate fully into either culture. Okay. Uh, the government determined at this time that Native Americans were no longer sovereign over their own affairs. It used to be when you went in a reservation, you ran the reservation the way you, you wanted to, and the United States stayed out. But, but then they decided to take away their sovereignty or their ability to manage themselves. And they were categorized as domestic dependent nations. So dependent, not independent. So laws continue to strip away any of the promises of the past, okay? And of course, the big ones, the, the landmark case is Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. Um, what does this say? Congress could ignore any existing treaties and make whatever Indian policies they chose, ignore anything from the past, okay? So that's a big one. That breaks all the treaties. That just simply says whatever we've said before, whatever agreements we have are null and void. We're moving forward with a clean slate and we're going to do whatever we want. Okay. Another famous case is ex parte crow dog. Uh, so what is, what's that? That this rules that only Congress <clears throat> could decide if an Indian was a citizen. Uh, so crow dog was a, a Lakota Sioux. And on, in 1881, he shot and killed Spotted Tail, a Lakota chief. So there's different accounts of the background of the killing. Um, tribal council dealt with the incident according to Sioux tradition. And Crow Dog was made to pay restitution to the dead man's family. Of course, that wouldn't be the way he would be tried in an American court, right? If you committed murder, you'd, you'd be... You, you would get a stiffer sentence than that. But this is the way the, the Sioux tradition was. But the U.S. authorities stepped in and prosecuted Crow Dog for murder in a federal court. He was found guilty and sentenced to hang. Okay, But then the Supreme Court steps in, and they then ruled that unless authorized by Congress, federal courts had no jurisdiction to try cases where the offense had already been tried by the tribal council, so Crow Dog was therefore released. So what's important about, about this case? This case was the first time in history that an Indian was held on trial for the murder of another Indian. Uh, the government did not have jurisdiction over a crime committed by one Indian on a reservation against another. So Crow Dog was set free. Uh, this illustrated the inherent sovereignty the tribes possessed and the authority of tribes to govern over anything and in any manner unless Congress stepped in and expressly limited, limited or prohibited it, okay? Uh, the next is the, the Dawes Severalty Act. So this is going, going back to reservation. When the reservations were first set up, a large piece of land, the tribes that were there and the, and the people that were there were allowed to move over it how they wanted. Uh, but then they decided that we're going to change the reservations, divide them up into individual tracts for each family to be more like white homesteads. So now you're going to be on a little square land instead of your ability to move across it. You know, again, the natives didn't believe in private property, so they moved across land, did what, did what they wanted. But now the American government says, no, you've got to be on a piece of land, okay? Uh, of course, this is encouraging Americanization. So they took the reservation and chopped it up into checkerboards and gave everybody a piece of land. This is yours now, okay? Uh, but what, what happened is there was some extra land at the end left and the greedy whites took it for themselves. So the Native Americans lost more land. They, they, they get their freedom on the reservation, take away, stay in this little square. And oh, by the way, we're, we're going to take, you know, uh, one third of the land, uh, away from you. Okay. So it's almost like whatever these people do, it never works out. And you could, you could make that argument very easily. Uh, it just, you know, everything to them seems to be a scheme to get their lands. And it worked over and over and over, okay? Okay, an important term in your book is the 1868 Sioux Treaty, okay? So this is, uh, this is the treaty that put them on the reservation. So looking at this map here, um, the kind of light green that you see across the map, parts of Colorado, Nebraska, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, 
this was going to be the reservation. Okay, so guaranteed the Lakota ownership of the Black Hills. This is what this area is called in the Dakotas as well as hunting rights, rights elsewhere. So this had been their sacred land anyway. So even though they're defeated and they're told to go on a reservation, they weren't that upset. Okay, if, it, if we have to go somewhere, we'd like to go here. So they, they were happy about this. Um, so this is agreed on in a treaty, and the treaty gave the Sioux people the Black Hills in South Dakota and Wyoming. This was their sacred lands and had been their hunting grounds for hundreds of years, okay? And, and it's all good. Well, not, not, not completely, okay? White men crossed into the territory secretly and prospected for gold and found gold. They discovered gold. They weren't supposed to be there, but they went in anyway. And uh, word gets back to the government uh, that gold was found on the, on the uh, Sioux uh, uh, reservation. Okay, so of course, Grant, he got his eyes open. You always want to have a source of gold if you're, uh, you know, uh, the American government. You you back your currency by gold, so you, you, you can't get enough gold, okay? So... Uh, of course, Grant's, you know, kicking himself. We just gave that land to them. Now it's got gold on it. So what do we do? So he, he decides to send a general from the Civil War, a young general named George Armstrong Custer. I'm going to slip on Custer. You go secretly into the reservation lands and you determine and confirm if there's gold there. OK, he goes, he confirms it. Uh, so so Grant comes back to the Sioux. And says we want to buy the land back, but they they refuse. No, you. What do you mean? What are you talking about? We you just gave it to us. We're happy with it. Go away and let us live our lives. But now here you are back. You want it again, okay? So Grant gets angry about this and and starts to threaten them. And word is leaked out that there's gold on Sioux land. So a gold rush ensues. I mean, you you tell you know enough people especially white men, that there's gold somewhere, they're all going to go there by the thousands and tear everything up to try to find the gold. So the land, this sacred land, was inundated with miners and prospectors. Okay, So don't forget how the Native Americans felt about the sacredness of the land, and these white people keep on tearing it up. Okay, uh, So Sitting Bull is the chief of the Lakota, and he's very angry, and he, he has a council with other chiefs, and they decide to just leave, go go somewhere and, and wait this out and see what happens. Let, let the gold rush, you know, end and we'll work this out. So many chiefs of other tribes and, and their men joined, joined the Sioux and Sitting Bull. And they went to a place called Little Bighorn to wait it out. Uh, many thousands of men, okay. Uh, Grant hears about this, so Custer sent out, and they assume it's got to, they've, they've got to be organizing for a huge rebellion. They're angry about the land that they're going to they're going to attack. So Custer sent in to quell this assumed rebellion. Uh, Custer had 1,000 men, a fair amount of men, but there were 7,000 with Sitting Bull, and they have a, an engagement, and this of course is called Custer's Last Stand, the Battle of the Little, the Little Bighorn. Uh, every troop in Custer's uh, uh, detail was killed, including himself, 36 years old. So Custer's last stand became a rallying cry, and Americans, America's history has held this up as an atrocity committed by Native Americans. It also became a reason to exterminate Native Americans. So I just told you the true story about it. I mean, I don't know how you can see the atrocity from the native side. It looks to me like this whole thing happened from greed on the white side, okay? But but this is how history is. It can be very nationalistic and you know written from the guys at the top and the good parts and all those types of things. We don't want to tell the story in a way that makes us look bad. We want to always be heroic, okay? So we have these moments. Custer's last stand, an iconic defeat that's been used as a rallying cry uh, to create American nationalism. It, it, kind of the same thing with the Alamo. You know, the Alamo uh, was an event that happened uh, in the Texas Revolution. Uh, uh, this is, of course, many years before Custer. Uh, 
but uh, you know you have a couple you, you have a couple of American heroes killed there: Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, and you have this slogan, this you know rally and cry. Remember the Alamo. There's Davy Crockett fighting to the last his last breath out of ammunition. Well, I mean the truth about the people at the Alamo, these were essentially squatters in Mexico that were that were. Uh, having slavery in a country that didn't allow it. Okay, now to to be fair, initially the the Mexican government did allow them to bring slaves, but then the government changed and and they had a different constitution and, and they changed. You no, know, well, we're going to enforce it now. So they they told the they told the settlers to if you're going to have slaves, you, you've got to leave. Well, they decided to not leave. So and I'm not trying to take away any heroics in any 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 of these stories. Uh, the men that died under Custer at, at uh, Little Bighorn, the men that died at the Alamo are heroic and they're American heroes. But let's, let's just understand what this real story is. Neither, neither one was, was an example of a, an, an aggressiveness by the other side and some kind of you know, uh, uh, all-encompassing assault. They, they were simply defending their own lands. Okay? Uh, so Little Bighorn would be the last victory for the Indians in this in these Indian wars. Uh, the Sioux were hunted relentlessly for killing Custer, and as we saw, finally defeated. The Nez Perce finally surrendered. And one by one, the Native Americans have been conquered and subdued, okay? Uh, but But Custer's last stand gave the Americans a justification for conquering the Indians, and it, in their minds, it proved them to be the savages the government thought they were all along, okay? And again, many people don't know that it was provoked by a gold rush of white people who should not have been on the land in the first place, so just like the Alamo, provoked by people who refused to abide by the law. In this case, refused to abide by Mexico's prohibition of slavery. So these two events, very exaggerated, but did much to promote the ethnocentrism of the era and add to the embellished wild, wild west, this, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, a mysterious uh, adventure story of the wild, wild west, okay? Most Americans, especially white, see Custer as a hero even today and are sympathetic to him and his men, that in their minds, and many History classes in K through 12 taught everybody that they were massacred by these Indians. Well, they, they were defeated by a much larger force, but they didn't just do it for no reason. They came, they, it, it was a retaliation, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned the ghost dance earlier. Um, this was a dance uh, that, was, that was designed to push the whites back across the sea to return to their old ways, okay? Uh, but of course it was not meant to be. Their time as a free people was over. In a land that coveted freedom, okay? Um, okay. Uh, lost my spot here. Give me one second. There we go. So so whites saw this dance and feared it. They, they thought it was a war dance, and they felt it would provoke violence or a war, okay? So at a place called Wounded Knee, in the in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, uh, the Lakota people, mostly men, uh, I'm sorry, older men, women, and children, they were doing this dance, uh, which they were prone to do, and it was harmless and innocent. They were doing this dance, but the soldiers that were there, the American soldiers that were that were, of course, you know, watching them and and you know, monitoring them. They saw it as a war dance and thought that it was a threat. They are about to attack us. Okay, so uh, instead of allowing that to happen, the American troops attacked them. Okay, so the, the Lakota people were massacred for no apparent reason, but they were doing a dance. Innocent victims, they were not being threatened. The troops were worried about the ghost dance. And here you see on the left the image of these mass graves and these dead natives and you know a, a a habit that we'll see over and over and we've seen a little bit of it already where white men are happy to get in the picture of of a 
you know, of a, of a people that they've just killed. And we'll see down the road here lynching, pictures of lynching where the whole city comes out to to pose in, with, with the man hanging from the tree, okay? So in an odd kind of response and, and an indicator of the level and the depth of hate that these people had for people that weren't like them. So Wounded Knee would be the last hurrah for the Native Americans, okay? And, and uh, this era is over. Uh, the deaths at Wounded Knee stand as a final indictment of decades of relentless United States expansion, white ignorance and greed, uh, chaotic and conflicting policies, and bloody mistakes. So this, this event marks the true end of the frontier. It's, it's over. There isn't an, there, it's, it's not a frontier anymore because you've conquered it all, okay? 1893, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner proclaimed the American frontier to be closed as there were no further lands that require conquest. So the westward expansion of the United States was complete and, and had accomplished much, and the ideals of manifest destiny had been realized. You know, as, as the still young country had expanded across the entire continent to the Pacific coast, okay? The image in the bottom on the right of the native on the horse, and you see him kind of slumped over. This is called the end of the trail, a very famous uh, kind of uh, statue, and you see it in paintings and so on, a famous image. So this symbolically represents the end of the free native life. This is their final defeat. It's the end of the trail. So it represents a warrior uh, sprinting toward a cliff on a horse. And as the horse approaches the cliff, it slams on the brakes, forcing the Indian to slump forward, and it kind of teeters there for a minute. This is, this is your last chance, but then you ultimately fall over the cliff, okay? So the sprint represents the race to stay ahead of the white man to keep their old ways. And the fall off the cliff represents their final defeat, okay? Um, so this is the end of the frontier. And again, according to, to Turner, Frederick Jackson Turner, the historian, in the process of, of the frontier wars, the American character had changed. Okay, they became a different type of people than the Americans around the East Coast. These people that came West, they became a people on the move and seemingly able to face any obstacles in their path. Like I said, after previously being a landlocked society on the Eastern Coast, penned in by the Appalachian Mountains. The westward expansion had created a different type of people with different values than their eastern brethren or, or their European brethren, okay? Uh, why? Because the challenges of a constantly moving frontier across a vast piece of land resulted in the creation of a new American image, which was different from their English roots as well as their own people in the eastern United States. The, the idea of the wild, wild west became mythic before it was even over. And everybody wanted to make these people heroes. And, uh, the, you know, the conquest of the frontier in the west took on a meaning all its own. Propelling these American pioneers to the heights of popularity worldwide. These people were considered her heroic and their exploits captivated the country as well as capturing the imaginations of people in Europe. Everybody wanted to hear tales about the wild, wild west. I mean, the truth is the story needed no embellishment, no exaggeration, yet that's what happened. And uh, the stories of the west became exaggerated beyond their reality. Uh, according to the historian Roger A. Hall, the drama of the frontier as it was presented to Eastern audiences in the late 19th century was certainly fictional, even when it sprang from actual events. It both per perpetuated myths and provided realistic images, okay? So the conquering of the West was immediately exaggerated and turned into myth, and these larger-than-life characters, gunslingers, sheriffs, fighting savages, the, the white... Uh, People always winning, okay? I mean, this was exaggerated and built to a, you know, a, a, to be much larger than it was. And, of course, we still buy it, right? Uh, Hollywood still makes Western movies, and we, and we like that. We, we, it's all about the Wild West. We, we're attracted to that. The true story is much less romantic, not so inspiring, okay? Uh, so all the exaggerations and embellishments about the savage Indian, gunfighters, Tall Tales of the West, it's really a very small part of the story. 
these things happened, but they were a small part of the story, but they're made to be the biggest part of the story. So it's not exactly how it, it, it happened. So these, so these, these, uh, these stories become, become, you know, uh, huge and people, heroes and, and legends and legendary people, uh, stories of captivity. And, and this happened many times. Uh, the natives would come and raid a, a community and kidnap uh, white people and take them back into their tribes. Okay, you, you see the story, the the book there, uh, the story of Mary Jemison. She was kidnapped at a young age. Uh, members of her family killed in front of her. She was taken to the native uh, uh, tribe and lived there. And when she finally, years later, had the chance to be uh, let let free, she wanted to stay. Okay, uh, but Captivity stories, especially natives kidnapping white women, were very popular. Uh, that's a that's a subject that gets everybody fired up. Okay, so these these stories were embellished, and you know they they were always told to, uh, made out to be one sided. You know, uh, they they never mentioned atrocities committed by people of European descent upon African American. I'm sorry, Native Americans. Uh, so these, these stories became exaggerated and helped to create the myth that Native Americans were barbaric savages. Uh, even two American frontier legends, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Uh, Boone was known as the Indian killer. Uh, Davy Crockett was known as the Indian fighter. Okay, But according to the historian uh, Bert Fireman, the West was not won by guns. It was won by shovels and sweat. The truth is the true heroes of the West were the people that came to it and fought through it, came across an, an unforgiving land and tried to, you know, hack a hack a living out of the ground with their with their hands and shovels and hard, hard work. That's the story of the West. That's that's how the West was won. OK, but we don't like to talk about that. You know, it, hard work by tenacious people is nice, but it's not heroic and, and it doesn't make for good stories and good movies okay um, okay but these tenacious people had developed their own character that tamed the West okay but but understand the true story not as exciting as exaggerations okay uh, Stuart L Udell another story and what does he say about this spent a lifetime studying heroic figures of the West such as Wyatt Earp Billy the Kid Jesse James he concluded that he was unable to find a single thing any of these killers did to advance the cause of civilization. Yet several hundred books have been written that have made these men icons for millions of Americans. Okay, so all, all these people here, Wyatt Earp, Billy the Kid, Jesse James, all were people that were there but a small part. But yet we've we've had dozens and dozens of movies and books. And, and when you think of the Wild West, you think of these men. They were a very small part of it. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody uh, takes this <clears throat> takes this <clears throat> desire for people to, to 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 experience the Wild West a step further. So Buffalo Bill, he's called that because he was one of the buffalo hunters that was hired after the Civil War to go into the into the uh, plains and kill the buffalo. So he's one of those guys that went into the uh, plains and indiscriminately killed buffalo just to get rid of them. This is also where the Buffalo Bills get their get their name, the football team. Okay, so he starts the Wild West show. Okay, Buffalo Bill and the Wild West show, and what this is is kind of part carnival, part rodeo, part circus, but a very large uh, kind of uh, you know uh, show that he would he would travel around the country and people would come out and watch you know uh, all these all these people in kind of recreations of, of what happened, battles and, you know, Indian fights and gunfights and, of course, all, all make-believe, but to, but to show what it was like, of course, exaggerated, okay? Uh, this became extremely popular uh, throughout the United States and also in Europe. He actually took this show to Europe and did it over there. So Europe and the East can't get enough of the Wild West. In fact, sadly, many Indians were hired to be in the show and play themselves, including Sitting Bull. So Sitting Bull is always going to have the 
the distinction of being the man that defeated Custer. Okay, and of course, white America hated this man and they were afraid of him. But here, here you are, not that many years later, uh, he is now in this show playing himself. And of course, people come from all over to, to, to get a look at Sitting Bull, this this native chief. Okay, uh, so they they came into the show to play themselves as the defeated but proud warriors. Uh, and people criticize Sitting Bull. How, don't don't you have any shame? How how could you do this? But in his mind, it beat being on a faceless reservation that had no link to his past. Okay. Okay. Let's do a supplemental lecture right here. We'll call this "How the West Was Won." Okay. So we know we know what's going on here. This is a review of my lecture. Okay. So let me give you a sketch outline here first. Number one: background development. Uh, and we'll talk about the movie called How the West Was Won. We'll talk about Manifest Destiny. We will talk about Frederick Jackson Turner again. A little bit of review here. Frontier Line, the end of the frontier. And more importantly, perhaps, this, this idea of this new American character that had been developed from, from this experience. Number three, this new American character is called the Rugged Individualist. And we'll talk about exaggerations, the Wild West show, pulp books, John Wayne, okay? Uh, the relevance of the lecture number four. The truth of the Western expansion era is like much of recorded American history. And these people's lives and experiences get lost in legend and the real history is obscured. Today, a typical American is still not ready to let go of the myths of their Western history and embrace the realities of the American story, okay? Okay, so that's a long one, but you can you can go back and play it over if you like, okay, to make sure you got it down right. Let's get started. I'm going to start you with a couple of, uh, of films here, okay? Uh, this is from a, a very famous movie, How the West Was Won. This was done in 1963 by MGM. Now, I happened to grow up in, this, in the town that MGM was in. So in 1963, I was seven years old. And I remember, you know, MGM was right down the street from me, and they always, it was a huge place, and they always had these big posters up about the 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 next movie coming out, and How the West Was Won was a was a huge one. All the stars in that era wanted to be in this movie, and they mostly were. So in the town I grew up in, you'd see Indians and natives and cowboys walking around, and horses, all extras from making this movie. Uh, that was kind of the way it was to live where I lived. Okay. So go ahead and watch these two uh, these two How the West Was Won movies. Watch the watch the trailer first. How the West Was Won trailer. This is a preview that, that would have been seen at the, in that time to, of course, promote the movie. And then the last one, How the West Was Won, the grand finale. Uh, this is the last scene of the movie. Okay, so the movie's over and the West is won, and you have these characters. Of course, you didn't see the movie, but the the woman singing the song is is the first one of the first people you meet in the movie, and then of course goes over years of time. Okay, but now she's an old woman. But what I want you to know, mostly watch in in the grand finale is is not not so much that. But I mean, go ahead and watch the whole thing. It's only uh, a little over four minutes long. But at the end, the narrator comes in and starts to talk about the grandness and the greatness and and the heroicness of what happened, and it, and it in a very short time it goes from from the you know the uh, frontier to modern day, and you see how quickly it happens, and how quickly the land changes, and how the and how the Europeans, the Americans come in and strip mine and do all these things, and the land is changed and, until finally you have a, a huge metropolis with a freeway full of cars. Okay, so uh, go ahead and watch those two those two films, and then we'll come back and keep going here. Okay, so. So we're back to manifest destiny here, okay, and this idea uh, of what that is. And, of course, that had been the backbone of American expansion westward uh, in the 19th century. And the truth is it can't be denied that a birth of a very powerful nation had been the result. So I want to look at some lyrics here. Uh, this is from the, from the film How the West Was Won, okay. Promised land, the land of plenty rich with gold. Here came dreamers with Bible, fist, and gun. So an odd combination there, Bibles, fists, and guns, okay? Bibles and fists and guns about violence, so not, not maybe hand in hand. Come for land, across the plains their wagons rolled. Settlers come, 
hell-bent for leather, that's how the West was won. Okay, is that the truth? Side by side, they tamed the savage prairie land. Savage, these people were savage, according to them, and they tamed them. Well, they, they weren't necessarily savage to their own culture. They were just living there, doing having their life. Nothing could stop them, not wind, nor rain, nor sun. That's that rugged individualist American. Side by side, these pioneers from every land. Uh, Americans came from everywhere in Europe. All pulled together, that's how the West was won. So you know, it's it's suggesting an heroicness and, and this great thing that happened, okay? And they sang of the day when they would rest their boots in a land where the still waters flowed, where the dreams of a man and a wife could put down roots and their love and the seeds of love would grow and grow and grow. That's all very nice, you know, that you dream of this day when you can relax and, and dreams of a man and a wife. That had been going on there for thousands of years with Native American people. There's nothing new about that dream. They've been doing it for, for generations, okay? Dream by dream, they built a nation on this land. It cannot be denied. Forage and freedom for every mother's son. Here it is, the beautiful, the promised land. We won't forget them. That's how the West was won. Okay, so, of course, an, an embellished kind of approach to describing this. And these people were heroic. I mean, were they? Were they? I think in many ways they were, but not in every way. Okay. Lots of evidence to uh, um, uh, incidents that happened in situations that were not very heroic and, and quite, in, in fact, quite shameful. Okay, so back to our angel. Uh, we we saw her earlier, and we talked about you know, she's enlightening the path as she comes west, and the future's behind her, and everywhere she goes, the the past, you know, is diminished. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so. You know, it was clear by the end of the 19th century that America would be for white people. That that's that's what it was designed to be. The government, society, culture <clears throat> continued to be motivated by white supremacy. You know, and a country and a government that was to be an advantage for white people. Okay. So back to Frederick Jackson Turner. American development has exhibited not merely advance along a single line, but a return to primitive conditions on a continually advancing frontier line <clears throat> and a new development for that era. In this advance, the frontier is the outer edge of the wave. And here's the key point, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the comment to take from this, the meeting point between savagery and civilization. So even a scholar and a historian at that time is pushing this idea that one people civilized and one people are savage, okay? Uh, but his frontier thesis becomes a very popular, you know, idea, okay? Uh, and it spoke boldly uh, of the apparent right of Europeans to march across the land, ultimately for the betterment of it according to them, okay? Uh, so according to Turner, uh, and this is kind of his quick history of what happened to this land. It begins with the Indian and the hunter. It goes on to tell of the disintegration of savagery. So the disintegration of savagery. So no matter what you do, you're going to describe these people as savage. No matter what they do, I should say. They're going to always be described as savages. Okay. Uh, by the entrance of the trader, the pathfinder of civilization, the great white man. We read the annals of the, of the pastoral stage and ranch life, the exploitation of the soil by the raising of unrotated crops of corn and wheat in sparsely settled farming communities, the intensive culture of the denser farm settlement, and finally the manufacturing organization with city and factory systems. So he goes from the Indian hunter to, to factories and cities. And this happened in a very short few decades, it didn't happen over hundreds of years. In a few short decades, the West was transformed by the people that came there, okay? Uh, so, of course, his theory, like the government survey maps during the Homestead Act that said that these lands were empty, uh, he claims that these lands were virgin lands, wide open, empty, ready for settlement. But we've already learned that that's not true. Millions of people live there, but they would soon be pushed out by God's chosen people, Okay. So like everyone else, Turner failed to mention the effect this movement had on the Native Americans that had been living in that land for thousands of years. Uh, Turner spoke of the frontier 
and westward expansion, also as components of the development of an American character. And we've talked briefly about this already, but we're adding to it here. This idea that Americans were rugged individualists. And this is a, this is a moniker that, that Americans still carry and in many cases promote. We, we like this, this, this description of us, okay? Uh, uh, so this is a concept in his thesis. Uh, that this westward expansion and this constant movement of the frontier line was responsible for the creation of an American character that became known as the idea of the rugged individualist. This idea was born right here. These people, these men, not take no for an answer, no task too big. These western people developed a bravado, and this was extended each time this frontier line moved and a new European settlement was begun. Okay. Uh, they wanted their way and did not let anything stop them. A uh, hundred years later, or maybe not quite that many, 1958, just to kind of bring it a little bit forward here and give you an example of, of how the past affects the, the, the future in this case. It's been a while ago, but this is, part, this is still in, in my lifetime. A book was written called The Ugly American about the perceived arrogance of Americans, specifically men, when they traveled abroad. Of course, so this book was inspired by Turner's thesis. And even today, modern Americans, especially men, are seen around the world as bold and arrogant, ethnocentric. They believe their way is the only way. Okay. So I bring this up because isn't this happening today? I mean, don't we see lots of evidence about this kind of thing happening today? People don't like Americans when they are abroad. Why? <clears throat> starts back in this era. So again, another reason why it's important to go further back in history than your own life. This uniquely American character, which was perhaps best personified in more modern times, my lifetime, again, maybe not all of yours, but, but the, the actor John Wayne best personified this rugged individualist, okay? Uh, and this masculinity, okay? And this defiance and single-mindedness that was also apparent, uh, it, it, but but also seen in the way that these white people dealt with the indigenous people, the lands. They now claimed it as their own by pushing these people out, excluding them, and in fact, ultimately removing them and exterminating them from their ancestral lands to reservations. So, you know, again, a movement support, supposedly ordained by God took on characteristics, characteristics that were hardly divine. According to the historian Gordon S. Woods, the European invasion led to Indians being lied to and cheated of their land and their furs by greedy white traders and land-hungry migrants. So the New Republic continually violated native treaty rights and killed or displaced tens of thousands of Indians. Gordon S. Woods is a, is a very prominent and popular modern day historian has written many, many books about this era. And this is his assessment of, of what this era was about. This, this heroic and grand westward expansion that Hollywood's made a, you know, an industry out of. This is more of, a, of the truth right here. It was an invasion. They were lied to. They were cheated from their lands, taken, their furs taken, by, by greedy people, I and mean, then they were they were killed or displaced. And this this is this is the truth. Okay, so the relevance of the lecture, the truth of the Western expansion era, is like much of recorded American history, and these people's lives and experiences get lost in legend, and the real story history is obscured. Today, a typical American is still not ready to let go of the myths of their Western history and embrace the realities of the American history, okay? I'm sorry, the American story, okay? Okay, um, that is the end of chapter 16. Thank you.